Now, dear friends, when our Lord finally was saying goodbye to his disciples, this is what he said. If you will please turn with me to Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse 49. 48 and 49, please. Perhaps that will... It will give us a wider perspective if we read 47 also. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And now, oh, my dear friends, no commander likes to send his forces in an ill-equipped manner into the battle. One of the tragedies of the Great War, the Last War, was that the factories and the armaments of Britain, when Hitler was poised to cross the channel, the channel crossing is very short. You do it by boat or by hoovercraft, and it's very short. Just you could do it between Calais and Dover in just about an hour or so, a little over an hour, depending on the fury of the waves, of course, just a little. Now, short of armaments, short of courage, short of firepower, well, that's a Awful thing to be short of, you know, especially in a battle such as the battle we face. So what did the Lord Jesus say? Look, I'm going to fill you with power. I'm going to equip you. You're not going to be deserters or those to turn tail, you're going to confront and overcome. So, the enemy, I give you power. So, friends, what was the sequel of this? The sequel of this you see in Acts, the second chapter. In Acts, the second chapter, we shall just note a few things here. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were not at sixes and sevens, you see. They were not at cross purposes. They were with one accord. One of the things 
that I have always insisted upon in our worldwide work, there should be unanimity, like the early church. There should not be this fellow squeaking up here and that fellow uh, saying something else and so on and so forth but that there should be a unanimity, one heart. Because if God is guiding us, there should be one thought, one direction. Now, of course, we have got so diverse in our ways that, you know, people talk of multiculturalism. So people from various cultures, how can they think alike? You will see how the, from the start, the early church comprised of people who were drawn in from every nation. So as they were there in prayer, second verse, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. A rushing mighty wind. They did tell me in the Hebrides in Scotland, that there was such a mighty shaking that even the furniture would be found to rattle or the china in the sideboard. There was the power of God in the midst and people walking down the hills would hear the music of heaven. Marvelous music coming up from heaven. So, we see that when the power of God was sent upon these frightened, beleaguered people, just a small company of people who thoroughly felt beaten up. Our captain is gone. You see, and the flag droops. There appeared unto them the third verse, cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, folks, and in this great multitude, there was great amazement as people came round and said, Hey, what? Here are men talking our languages, and we are from far away. We have just come here for this to worship. How, it was, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So what do we notice here? Those tongues were manifested in to people to understand the mighty works of God. 
which otherwise they would not have heard. They were not just meant as a decoration or some kind of emblem of acceptance. No, but of course we take something out of the scripture and make it into a matter of strife and contention. We don't like to see the whole background and all the meaning in it. So you will see great controversies arising out of this and uh, all kinds of spirits also have gotten in. You know, Buddhists speak in tongues and uh, Islam is so full of occultism and magic. The demons have taken hold of these things and have duplicated and deceived many people. On one occasion, my father was visiting a city where a woman was supposed to be a mighty Christian. And lo and behold, she broke out into some strange, what shall I say, you know, words which nobody there could understand. And, uh, well, my father felt a shock because he knew it was not of the Holy Spirit. So he put his hands on her and prayed. And that was the end of her tongues. When the evil spirit left her, she could not speak in that kind of strange, whatever it was. You see, now, even today, across the world, I have found right into Australia, everywhere, just a kind of physical attraction, exertion, as though some uh, the church is meant to have calisthenics in Sunday morning. You see? No. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. So by the time sermon come, time comes, as some people said to me in Australia, I believe, uh, you know, Mr. Daniel, we get so lost in this kind of thing, and then there's no time for the Word of God. Now, I find that that is very contrary to Scripture. Jesus sat and taught the Word of God. Paul preached the Word of God. Go and take this good news to every creature. And it was the word of God that saves people, that changes the hearts of people. Now we have got people just making an entertainment center of some of our places of worship. Pure entertainment. And you take that entertainment out, there's nothing there. Take the electronics out, there's nothing there. People feel deflated. They're powerless. Well, 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 that's far from what God intends for us. Or his church. Now, my dear friends, when Paul was converted, if you will please turn to the 
You know the ninth chapter of Acts. Ninth chapter and the seventeenth verse. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus which appeared unto you in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, folks, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, it is the promise of God, of Jesus, if you turn to John 14, chapter, you will notice how the Lord Jesus Christ gave us very clear marks or markings by which we discern the Holy Spirit. The 14th chapter and 16 and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ left, was there to be a vacuum? The captain is gone. See, the object of our worship is gone. So what? There's nothing more to be done. No. Jesus said, I want the Holy Spirit who will come after me to abide with you forever, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. See, now the Lord Jesus Christ defined the Holy Spirit first as the Spirit of truth. So when I see people who say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they speak lies, I say, no, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're filled with a lying spirit. The devil was the liar from the beginning. You see, a lying tongue is an abomination to God. See how freely lies used to come to my mouth. I sometimes say I had a factory up here, and you know, and when the factory got working, whew, lies would flow. How can a Christian speak lies? What kind of spirit is that? It's a lying spirit. And you know, it's, a, it's complete confusion. It's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, is the Spirit of truth, absolute truth. If I'm, I have always said, I heard my father say this first, my word is more than a document. Of course, his word was more than a document. There were no lies in my, in my home. As a matter of fact, liars would suffer a lot. No lie could be hidden. Lies would just come out. We would have a lot of servants, you know. When I was growing up, we had maids and servants in the house somebody to take care of the garden, somebody for something else, and so on and so forth. And uh, no, nor could they speak lies. It was a place where the Holy Spirit, the home was a place where the Holy Spirit was in control. And if we children spoke any lies, they would come out. My father at the family altar would take some scripture and just our family prayer was a very short 
time together as a family, which of course was never missed on any account. The family altar. And there, when my father would take some scripture and just expound it a little, I would be like a cat on hot bricks because I would say, somebody has been telling daddy all that I have been doing. See, everything would be, he is the spirit of truth. Nothing can be hidden. Oh, how much is the cover-up today? And we need commissions. You know, if it was Britain, you would call it a royal commission to investigate something. And or you would have to call a, a group of senators and get them into a committee. Hey, look into this matter. Does this matter require impeachment or what? And so on. And by the time millions of dollars are spent, no truth really comes out. And even if it comes out, nobody has to has the courage to say wrong is wrong and right is right. What's the good of all that expenditure of time? Hot air. Because the spirit of truth is not there evidently. It's a lot of cover-up. You can't build a country on cover-up. You can't build a corporation on cover-up. You can't build a family on cover-up. You can't build your life on cover-up. He is the spirit of truth. So the first thing that Ananias, when he came to Paul, said, Come on, Paul, I've come to pray for you. Years ago, I remember... One day my uh, mother came to my dad and said, Oh, my son is terrible. He is kicking me. Oh, my, kicking a mother? Yes, I have heard fellows say and educated people say, I've kicked mother. We, have, we, lived in such t we live in such times today. Whatever it is, this fellow, oh, Daddy said to me, try to find this fellow and speak to him. I said, I don't know where he is, Dad. Oh, the mother volunteered. He's with his buddies. I will show you. And so she showed me the man. And as he came down, I said, would you please come? We'll have a little time together. And so I took him down where I was going to spend a little time of prayer. And I spoke to him certain words. I said, hey, fellow, have you been into immorality and all that? Oh, no, no, no. It was a lie, and I knew it. I said, okay, I'm going to spend some time in prayer out here. You go about some 50 yards away, and you pray. Let God speak to you. Well, soon I heard this fellow yelling and crying. I said, what's wrong? I went to him and said, what's wrong? He said, oh, my eyes are shut. I can't open my eyes. I said, did you speak a lie to me? Yes. And his eyes were so fast shut. You know, I had to address a meeting that evening. I had to walk back, in fact. Uh, I had gone to a solitary place to play, pray. And so as I walked back, I had to lead this fellow like a blind man. Young fellow. Just maybe 21 or 20. Whatever. I said, okay. 
your, your mother and your family will be in the meeting, and you come up to the mic and and you have been a slanderer and a blasphemer, and you have spoken evil about the preachers for nothing. Okay, ask their pardon. Then perhaps God will open your eyes. So finally I took him to the mic, I groped and took hold of the mic and said, I must ask pardon of my sister, my mother, because I did them much evil and, and I've slandered so many of you. Then at the end, close of the meeting, his eyes had not opened. I said, okay, let God do it. If he thinks, if God should decide that he needs to have his eyes closed for some more time till he really repents, fine. So, there it was. His mother came at the close of the meeting and led him away. And of course, his eyes were opened either that night or in the morning, whatever. You see, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, taking hold of the direction of God's church. But what do we see today? You know, and therefore, we see in the portion that we just read uh, in Acts 4 chapter, we read how the church was visited again by the, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So what was their prayer? 29th verse, 4th chapter of Acts. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What was the outcome? No pussyfooting here. And they speak the word of God with boldness. You see, folks, when you come to the to algebra or an equation, but can you can you change a digit of that equation? A plus B whole squared, what does it make? A squared plus B squared plus 2AB. Can you remove a single digit of that equation? No. God's truth has got to be proclaimed with boldness. Are we just inventing something, something, some new myth or story? No, not at all. You see, when I dwell on the history of the United States. My heart is always turned. A hidden history today. When in the reign of James, it was found in England that these men who wanted to worship God in freedom could not do so. A group of them went out to Holland under Robert Brown. But in Holland, they saw such pluralism. Anything goes. Modern Amsterdam is the worst city in Europe. Anything goes. My, how dreadful. 
And when they saw the pluralism of uh, Holland, they said, we cannot build a community here of godly people. Our children are going to become very secularized. You see, they are going to be a set of ungodly fellows. So let's get out of here. So they got out of there, touched, went back to England for a short stint, and said, let's go to the new world. Thus it was, the 102 of them set sail for Virginia. And the storms, which almost did them in, and they landed, of course, in Massachusetts. And one of them described the country as a hideous and desolate wilderness. Hideous and desolate wildness. Are we going to reduce it morally to that condition once again? My dear friends, and there they made their compact. Huddled in the Mayflower, they made 42 of those men made their compact. What was their compact? That they should, for the glory of God, and that there should be no self-seeking, and that there should be solidarity amongst them. These were their main tenets. And William Bradford believed that they could not rule without God. And there are voices today which say, well, we don't need God, we in God we trust any longer. What a tragedy has overtaken the land. So, when we you know, when the second president of the United States, John Adams, went to Harper, Harvard, trying to mix Oxford and Harvard together. No, it's Harvard. He went to Harvard. There were 100 in the student body and seven in the faculty. Six o'clock, morning prayers. And the college closed at five o'clock with evening prayers. And there was not to be any lying, blaspheming, picking of locks, or fornication. It was forbidden. You know, folks, those were the laws that governed Harvard at its inception. They wanted a country ruled by God's word and the righteousness of God and the truth of God. So, when we see the early church filled with the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They preached the word of God with boldness. So, I don't believe in pulling any punches. Truth, can, I can't amend truth. I have no authority, whatever. I cannot sabotage truth. Only the devil, I would be the devil and his henchmen if I tried to do so. But alas, how truth has become a casualty today. 
either we have the spirit of truth or we make truth a casualty in our land and in our hearts. What do we choose? Let us pray. Oh, precious Lord, what shall we choose? We dare not choose the devil to be our father. And yet there are so many who have pledged to give their souls to the devil saying we are Satanists. Have mercy upon them. And I thank you that some of these Satanists in England and out here are turning to you, seeing the void and the emptiness which Satanism and the oppression and the pain which Satanism has brought to them. Have mercy upon some of our boys and girls exposed to these things in our schools, O oh God. And some of these things which are being promulgated by all these books on magic and Harry Potter stuff and all that kind of thing as though that is the kind of best education that can be imparted to nations which are already plunged deep in the abysm of untruth. Oh, my Father, have mercy, we beseech you, on Western Europe and upon what is known as the civilized world today. We pray that we may pay heed to the words of Jesus, for there is nothing hid that will not be revealed. Oh, Father, I can't hide anything. I can't hide behind the pulpit. I can't hide um, and cover up with priestly robes. For there is nothing hid which shall not be revealed. Oh, that our lives will be open and transparent. Oh, that we would be walking Bibles and living witnesses. Oh, Father, deliver, we beseech you, at this time when deception and cooking the books is, has almost brought Wall Street to its knees. Oh, my Father, have mercy, we beseech you, and let truth prevail in every quarter. The Spirit of Truth, we dare not repulse him no, Lord, I need the spirit of truth to govern my life, lest I should squander and waste it. I want the spirit of truth. We want to be filled with that spirit as the early church was. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.